What up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows, and on this episode, we're going to go over New Japan Pro Wrestling's Dominion and among other things that are happening in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Don't worry, we'll get back to talking about all night of Best of Super Juniors. I still have more to do, but other things fell into my lap, such as me interviewing 100 Proof Clark Connors. It has been a year since we last talked to Clark Connors. You can see that interview on YouTube, on Spotify, on the Square Circle Society Wrestling Newsletter, because it is currently in video format. I will upload the audio format soon, but it's better to watch the video because I add a lot more elements to the video and you could definitely see our interaction and it's definitely one of the best interviews I've done with Clark Connors. Clark Connors is part of Bullet Club, as you know, on April 14th and or the 15th of this year at Capital Collision, New Japan Pro Wrestling's pay-per-view he aligned himself with David Finley. It was the perfect, perfect thing to do to align yourself with David Finley. By the way, David Finley is the real leader of Bullet Club. It is not Jay White. I honestly think that Jay White is delusional in creating Bullet Club gold just because of how things played out. According to Clark Connors, the way that everything played out with Finley taking over Bullet Club, Finley had to let go of the past. And Finley is definitely a straight shooter, and he definitely does not wait for anyone else to tell him what to do. He decided to go in and hit Jay White over the head with his shillelagh, and that ended the era of Switchblade, King Switch, for being the leader of Bullet Club in Japan as a whole. Not like completely ended his era still, but just the era of Jay White in Bullet Club. And that was Finley breaking away from his past. So Clark Connors mentions that story and then also mentions his own story of the kind of things he had to do to let go of his past so he could become a new version of Clark Connors. And this is what we see as 100 proof Clark Connors, the one that can definitely fight you, the one that states that he is the number one junior heavyweight of New Japan Pro Wrestling. And by the way, I would love to know your comments about that. Do you think that Clark Connors is the number one junior heavyweight of New Japan Pro Wrestling? And then my second question is going to be, do you think that Clark Connors and Drilla Maloney are going to take over the tag team division of the whole entire world in professional wrestling. You can find these questions in Spotify. Spotify now has two options to encourage fans of the Square Circle podcast to participate and give your thoughts, your ideas, anything that you want to tell me in the form of a poll and a form of a Q&A. So in the event that you don't want to reach out to me via DM or email or on my Discord or anywhere where you can find me, you can easily and anonymously answer those questions via Spotify. Spotify now has the ability for you guys to interact with the episodes. You guys will see it when you open up the Spotify app. Please make sure that you are following the Squared Circle podcast on Spotify. We currently have 57 wonderful members who listen to the podcast. And the goal is to try to get to 100. So please tell a friend. You guys can answer the questions and you guys can definitely share the experience with them and everyone else. So those are the two questions that I am posing to my community and then the wrestling community. My interview with Clark Connors also got covered by Bodyslam.net because of Clark's comments towards Bullet Club Gold. And those are some spicy ass comments that he made about Bullet Club Gold, which I am in agreement with. I agree with what Clark was saying. Most of the time I was agreeing with him anyway, because it just made perfect sense. It really did. 
you know, if anybody wants to know, I do, in fact, enjoy Bullet Club. And I also enjoy United Empire. These two teams are going to have one hell of a summer going back and forth to see who is the best. We have a bunch of young talent, and I'm throwing TJP in there as being young talent because he is ancient. This guy has all the secrets in the world, okay? All the secrets in wrestling. Clark, on the other hand, has some words for TJP and Akira. You guys could go listen to that as well on the interview. Like, trust me. Clark did not hold anything back. Clark is definitely being 100 proof, 100 true, whatever you want to call it. Clark was just really honest in my discussion with him. And my podcast, the Square Circle Podcast, is always open to the other wrestlers that might have felt slighted against by Clark's words because they are the type of tell me how you really feel, Clark, type of comments. So again, my podcast is always open. My DMs are always open. My email is always open. I would love to have any of the other wrestlers mentioned in the interview with Clark Connors to come on and talk about it and probably curse him out back and say some shit and, you know, have a wonderful freaking summer between these two teams. Before United Empire came onto the scene, I was definitely a Bullet Club girl through and through. I still am. I see how many leaders it went through, how many championships they held, some stupid times, some good times, some soul times. And when I say soul, I'm referring to Tama and Loa. Once you kick them out, that's it. There's no more soul to Bullet Club. But I am really happy that David Finley decided to take what he wanted and turn Bullet Club into something of a destructive force in New Japan Pro Wrestling that what we need right now. That is what we need right now. We need this destructive force. Now, don't get me wrong. When Jay White was leader of Bullet Club, he was doing a fantastic job, even though it was mainly about him and his era and what is he doing. And yeah, we could definitely say that Bullet Club was definitely going the route of selling more merchandise, getting more money in everyone's pocket. You know, who can really complain about that? Like, I want money in my pocket. There's many ways for you guys to support me, but I'm not always going to put it out there like that to be like, hey, come and support me 24-7 because I want to give you value at the end of the day for you to come back and support me in a financial way. That's how my thinking works. The Jay White Bullet Club, on the other hand, was let's sell merchandise. It was similar along the lines of the Elite when they were there because the Elite got Bullet Club into stores without having the big machine behind them, the big marketing behind them. And that's an accomplishment that no one could deny about Bullet Club is the fact that Bullet Club is really supported by the fans and can really stand on its own and it has become its own thing. Now, people online complaining about Bullet Club and they think that it ran its course. No, it's only starting its course, especially with all of the young guys in here under David Finley. It's starting. Before, it was cool. It was great. You want to be part of Bullet Club, you go buy the shirt, you go support them. You can still do that. But now it's, let's see what new stories we can get with the young guys that are hungry, with the young guys that have been overlooked. Sure, the fans online are fickle and they jump from person to person to person to person. And their attention span is like two seconds. I'm being generous. I probably should have said five. But their attention span is like two seconds. And so most of these guys don't get enough love. Alex Coughlin gets love whenever this guy does very amazing things in the ring because he's very super strong. And I think that he's not real. Obviously, he's real, but I think that he might be a robot. That's because of the unbelievable things that he's able to do in the sport of professional wrestling and in the sport of blood sport of Josh Barnett's blood sport, man. Like it's freakishly amazing to watch Alex Coughlin in the ring. Guys like Gabe Kidd, 
who was on the most fastest rising start. And then it came crumbling down, which I won't get into the specifics, but it was very, very, very horrible. And if Gabe ever listens to this, I am extremely happy that he is still here with us and his mental health battles did not fucking win because I would have been pissed. But Gabriel Kidd or Gabe Kidd, Gabriel Kidd just rolls off the tongue. I apologize, Gabe, but it just rolls off the tongue. And he's definitely one of my favorites of the L.A. Dojo guys, as much as I love all the L.A. Dojo guys. But like Gabe is something special. And I like the fact that he was on this rise and he should have still rode the the rise, but shit happens. But I'm glad that he's back. I'm glad that he's in David Finley's Bullet Club as a war dog because he's ready to take over the world and fight everyone and anyone at any time. I already praised Clark Connors, but I'm going to praise him again. To have him in Bullet Club, not only can this guy fight the fight, And definitely love to rearrange furniture because if you have not been watching New Japan World, you guys should just get a subscription. It's $7 a month. I have one. It's the best subscription that I invest in. So that way I could talk to you about these guys. You know, as much as he loves to rearrange the furniture, if need be, this guy can definitely be a force to be reckoned with inside the ring. If you have not watched Clark Connors versus Murder Grandpa, Please go do so and get back to me with how awesome that match is. So the amazing thing about Clark that I always put over, as a wrestler, he can adapt to any style that is given. It may not be perfect, but he will adapt and he will find a weakness inside someone's arsenal of moves and capitalize And I saved the best for last, which is Drilla Maloney. So before he came to the New Japan Pro Wrestling scene for Best of the Super Juniors that just concluded, I knew nothing about him, even though apparently he was in certain matches with certain people. And I'm like, what? I know he's been around for a good while after doing research, obviously, but talking to wrestlers and seeing people on line share videos and other wrestling matches that he was in I'm like oh shit this guy's been doing it forever you can obviously see he's doing it forever not trying to take anything away from him but he is very good at what he does and he instantly drew me in to his charm and charisma and his colorful language which I find adorable I love his colorful language He definitely wears his heart on his sleeve. He definitely tells you what's what, and he doesn't sugarcoat anything. And he's really good in the ring. If you heard all of my reviews for nights one through six, me talking about Dan at the time, his chops are probably unmatched. If he ever gets into a choppy war with Murder Grandpa, I'm definitely going to go watch that one and see who can withstand whose chops. I love the fact that he's in Bullet Club, even though I accepted that he would be good in the United Empire just because he was having fun with the other guys. And I was watching all the IG stories and I was just following along as a fan. However, he captivated me. He definitely pulled the rug under all of us and just decided to join Bullet Club. And Clark Connors explains how he joined Bullet Club and, you know, It's a coincidence that both of them met up in a bar. Very coincidence. By the hand of the driller, he left the United Empire in shambles. Just mainly Catch-22, TJP and Akira, the current IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions. You know, Osprey didn't even comment on this, but Gideon Gray commented on this, which is kind of weird. From what I've heard through the grapevine and probably on commentary, I don't exactly remember where I heard it, but he did get brought in by Osprey, apparently. When I say he, I mean Dan Driller. And in a matter of six weeks, 
Dan managed to really captivate everybody and then destroy it. And then join the right team of Bullet Club without having a conversation first with the United Empire and be like, hey, this might not work out for me. But that's what happens when you are street raised, street born, and you have to survive for yourself and make decisions for yourself. And if you're not vibing with somebody, this is usually how it goes. It's like it was fun for a while, got annoyed. I want to do what I want to do. Driller is very independent. He's a very independent guy. So when things just don't align with what he wants, what he can do, the authority that he has over himself, he's going to go elsewhere. Now, we can argue if this is right or wrong, but that's not the point of this. I totally understand his decision, even if it was just to get up and leave because he couldn't take what was actually happening behind the scenes. And I understand because I'm from New York City. That shit happens here all the time, and it's a survival tactic. If you know that something is not going to elevate you or push you, even though the United Empire acts as a unit, as a team, most of the time, that's not something with a huge individual personality is used to. So they go on and move to another team that aligns with that individual personality. Everyone in Bullet Club under David Finley has their own individuality. And they can take their own individuality and do one of two things. Bring Bullet Club and David Finley gold, such as winning championship titles. Or bring a body count of everyone they have defeated. Together, they are at their strongest. And that is when they can definitely bring that body count to the table and together they could also bring tag team gold to the table individually they can definitely use bullet club tactics so if you guys don't know what bullet club tactics are it's basically when bullet club members go to the outside and use the outside to their advantage so when everyone is arranging furniture, it's not just to arrange furniture. It's to hurt the opponent, get the count out, get the win, get whatever you need to get. Because in Bullet Club, a win is a win is a win is a win. That's all it is. So they use Bullet Club tactics to their advantage. And that's another way of defeating their opponent by themselves, despite outside interference. Still, you got to win somehow right you got to survive somehow that's the whole mantra of bullet club is not only a us versus them mentality or an anti-japan thing like when it was originally made now it has turned into you got to get the job done and no matter how you do it a win is a win that's what clark was saying during the interview that it doesn't matter how many losses he suffered and he's not definitely gonna use that as a shield of not accepting those losses, but doesn't matter how Clark does in his matches, as long as he can beat the opponent, beat him up with a chair, even if it's post-match, to him, he's the winner because he's the one that's standing tall. That's the whole thing about Bullet Club now is that even in loss, you win because you're standing over your opponent after you beat them up after the fact. So a win is a win is a win is a win. Now, let's switch over to the United Empire for a quick second. I know I'm supposed to be going over Dominion, but all of this takes place in the realm of what's happening in New Japan, what's happening between these two teams. And United Empire is the opposite. And that's what I really love because United Empire really gives a different feel of a team when it comes to New Japan making factions. And they make so many factions. United Empire is, like it says in its namesake, it's united. It's an empire. It brings everybody from around the world into their team, and everyone works together as a unit. When one of the wrestlers or the tag teams have a match, they have their buddies there to second them at the side. And I honestly think that United Empire took a very devastating blow this year. You know, I 
still feel some type of way, even though, you know, it's a late congratulations to Aussie Open that signed with AEW. Look, I totally get it. But it just felt sort of underhanded. That's just my opinion on that. It just felt underhanded and you kind of leave United Empire wide open, especially when something could have been done in the wake of what stuff happened through the week. You know, it just could have waited a little bit longer until we got down to a cool period and you knew that they'll be okay because United Empire relies on each other's support, their cheerleading, and them being at their side to second them. And just to give them that extra boost to be like, oh, you got it, let's go. You know, don't let this happen, blah, blah, blah. Like, they're there cheering them on in the corner. And so... United Empire, even though they had a wonderful all-together match during the all-together pay-per-view that represented four different promotions for New Japan, All Japan, CMML, and like other wrestling promotions on that pay-per-view, I haven't seen the match yet, but what I'm about to say doesn't really include that particular happiness that they all had together, pun intended, in general... It feels like the United Empire has lost a step, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. Let's take Jeff Cobb, for example. And again, none of this is to get on these guys because I really do love them. I just want them to succeed. Like, there's something off about the United Empire. The United Empire will always be a strong unit together, but individually, there has to be that killer instinct, the same way that Bullet Club has that killer instinct in order to get those wins and get championships back to the United Empire. But again, let's take Jeff Cobb, for example. Jeff Cobb is an amazing athlete. There is no other Jeff Cobb. Jeff Cobb is a fucking tank. And you're telling me that due to Jeff Cobb's size and strength and the way that he can move around the ring, he cannot beat Zack Zabra Jr. for that New Japan Pro Wrestling World Television title? Let's face it, Zack Zaber Jr. to me is overrated. I respect the hell out of any technical wrestler because you guys know me. I love technical wrestling. If you're able to mix high flying and acrobatics with the technical stuff, I'll love you even more because you understand psychology. Zack just being a technical wrestler shouldn't be getting the upper hand on Jeff Cobb. Now, one could argue that because of Jeff Cobb's size, And momentum, depending on what is happening in the ring, sure, Zach could get a surprise roll-up. Zach could do a surprise thing because you're using judo at that point to make Jeff Cobb's body weight work for you to get the upper hand. And he's not really going to see it coming. Sometimes he does see it coming. And most of the time it's like, Zach, how the fuck are you, like, switching out of that? Like, that makes no sense. With the power and strength of Jeff Cobb, I am to believe that this guy can really hurt people. Like, I am under the illusion, the awesomeness that is Jeff Cobb. And then when you put him in there with Zach David Jr., who's a technical guy, he's going to get beat the fuck up. It's like if you put Zach in the octagon, he will survive, maybe. But then again, someone's going to come at him with a right hand and start just laying hammer fists on his face, it's like that. You destroy a technical wrestler because they're not thinking of protecting their face. They're not thinking of protecting their chest. They're thinking of how can I put this guy into a pretzel without taking too much damage or they'll take damage, still try to put you in a pretzel and then somehow come out fucking victorious. My biggest issue is that when I watch Zack Zaber Jr. matches, he always goes back to his fucking back his broken rib that's been broken forever, but yet then doesn't take time off to heal it, doesn't wrap it up, doesn't be like, hey, I can't wrestle. I need to take a couple weeks off. And he always goes back to that as a selling point. And I'm here like, bro, how are you still doing this if you are constantly hurt? And in every single match, that is your calling card that you want to sell 100% of the time. Well, not really 100% of the time because you forget to sell. It bothers me how Jeff Cobb gets treated in New Japan Pro Wrestling. It really does. There are times where he gets so close 
to holding New Japan Gold, and they take it away from him. And then he's on this really high momentum, and then they just cool him the fuck off. Like, no, don't cool off Jeff Cobb. If anything, Jeff Cobb should be leading right now and definitely racking up some wins, facing Zack Sabre Jr. again, which is going to happen in the G1. But, you know, this time around, he's going to have to do something different where he takes out Zack's arms or Zack's legs or take a page out of Bullet Club's book, man. And use Bullet Club tactics, like damage the shit out of him on the outside of the ring and leave him at the end of the building and then come back to the ring and like get a count out win. Because a win is a win is a win. Like at that point, yeah. Frustration may not be on your best side because that can definitely lead to you losing sometimes. But in the event like this, it's like, dude, you're not even on the same level as Jeff Cobb. So how are you defeating Jeff Cobb if Jeff Cobb has a very calm demeanor whenever he's in the ring? Jeff Cobb doesn't trip up on himself. Jeff Cobb doesn't get angry or frustrated. You can see it sometimes, but... He doesn't let that run him so that way he can make stupid mistakes and then pay for it later. Everything that Jeff Cobb does is exactly what he's supposed to do, exactly what a tank is supposed to do. Someone who's always technical cannot always get those reverses because even though Zach has a long body and a long reach, Jeff Cobb could just do one Fall away slam and bam, there goes the air out of your body. And then he could go for a quick cover. It may not mean much, but you never know. In the moment of having a professional wrestling match, the moment that your lungs expel that air, you're not going to get it back in time enough in the world of kayfabe, okay? And probably in the real world. But like a fall away slam from a big guy like that, go for the pin, try to get it. And sometimes, you know, you may get it because it could knock the person out. The person may not respond as fast or as quickly. Their body might be in pain. Like, it just gets me frustrated knowing that someone as good as Jeff Cobb doesn't get the respect and the flowers that he fucking deserves. So I hope one day that in New Japan Pro Wrestling, he gets a TV title or gets a championship title, you know. They all need, like, gold around their waist. The same way that Bullet Club wants to get gold, too. Both of these teams are what's good in New Japan Pro Wrestling. We have the other teams, which is cool as well, but for the most part, I am very interested and dedicated to both Bullet Club and United Empire, and I hope one day none of them tell me that I have to pick one because I'm not going to pick one. I'm going to give you guys my opinion on both sides and maybe their fuck ups, maybe not their fuck ups, but this is right down the middle. This is how I see it. This is how I call it. And I really do enjoy both of these teams. And for the longest, I have been wanting a Bullet Club versus United Empire feud. And I'll tell you why. And unfortunately, it had to start with like the David Finley Bullet Club, which is not a slight to him and all of his hard work. But I wanted it with when United Empire was first formed in those like six months, a little bit longer when they got like almost everybody and Jay White was still around because I know that Jay White and Will Ospreay would have made a really good story out of who's the best team. And I was really wanting a feud with them leading the charge. Now we get United Empire versus Bullet Club, but David Finley's Bullet Club, and I'm still excited for it, and I'm really happy about it. It may not be exactly what I wanted, but that's okay. It's still a form of Bullet Club. We got United Empire. We got some really deep stories. We got some really deep characters, and everyone has this layer to them. Akira Francesco is going to get more layers as a character going further into his career because he is the youngest out of everybody in this story. So it makes sense. You have the driller who has a lot of fucking charisma and a lot of deep stories and 
probably like a lot of mystery behind him and everything like that. And I just love talking about it and just talking about like his decisions and what he brings to Bullet Club. Clark, like, like I said, I give him praise all the time. There's Hinare, who has a lot of character development. And I've been on the bandwagon for Hinare since day one. And it's been amazing to watch him grow. It's been amazing to watch everybody grow here, too. Especially Gabriel Kidd. Amazing to watch him grow. And it's very cool to watch David Finley grow as well. Alex, we still got to see you grow. I got to see you grow. Even though you can beat the shit out of everybody. And basically, you can carry everybody. Because you're just... You're just an android. And if we ever do a correct Dragon Ball Z movie, Alex better be casted as an android if we ever get to do a correct Dragon Ball Z movie. I am currently excited for both teams. And I definitely want to see what the future holds for these guys. As much as I love supporting both Bullet Club and United Empire... For everyone that is listening out there and for my awesome fans over on Spotify and everywhere else, did you know that you can also sponsor me? I am accepting sponsorships for my travel to New Jersey on July 8th. As I am booked for Goddesses of War to do commentary again, I had my first opportunity last month and it was amazing. I believe I did decent slash good. My commentary partner, Riley Shepard, will probably say that I did great. And, of course, I get a pass if I did bad, but I know I did very well to bring stories to life, and that's what I want to do for professional wrestling. All I ever wanted to do was bring stories to life. This is why talking about Bullet Club and United Empire and the indie wrestlers that I meet, I want to tell your story. So if you are interested as a fan, as a wrestler, as whoever, and you supported my work through and through and you enjoy what I do and the value that I give, I do have an opportunity for you to sponsor me for July 8th for Goddesses Award Battle of Athena over in New Jersey. This is what you get. You get a shout out on Twitter, on the vlog, on the podcast episode and YouTube shorts. I will retweet and quote tweet your latest or newest podcast episode. I will share your podcast episode on the Square Circle Society Discord, which you should be signed up to if you haven't already. Link will be in the description below. And I will share your podcast episode on my newest Square Circle Society newsletter article that goes out to my readers which, again, the newsletter is an extension of everything that I do, including this podcast, including the Discord as well. And also, you get as bonus, you can redeem this at any time that you want. I am going to be opening up guest spots. This is available for wrestlers, for referees, and for wrestling fans. All you have to do is just contact me. So in addition to sponsoring me and me shouting you out everywhere and putting your link everywhere... You have the opportunity to redeem at any time the option to write an article for the Square Circle Society newsletter. You get your own byline. And you can also pick a day of your choosing and we could go live on any of the streaming services that I have. Or we can record an episode and we could talk about professional wrestling together and talk about various topics. So you could become a guest on the Square Circle podcast if that is what you want to do. So those are redeemable at any time after you sponsor me because I want to make sure that I give you a service and we could both help each other out. We could both collab. This is way more than what anyone else on the market is doing currently. So I have the ability to open up guest posts and I would love you to be a part of the Square Circle Society newsletter, Discord, everywhere else. It's for both of us to elevate each other and for me to show the world that fans do matter in the wrestling community and they get a spotlight as well. If you are interested in sponsoring me, Marie Shadows, 
who is going to be at Goddesses of War Wrestling Battle of Athena July 8th over in Jersey, then please hit me up in the DMs at Marie underscore Shadows. You can message me there. I'll definitely give you the list again and the package price. Or you can email me, squaredcirclepodcast at outlook.com, and you can ask me about the sponsorships as well. Sponsoring me means that I could get to and from the venue with a driver of my choice and I could get there safely and I could come home safely. It also means that I can eat properly and it also means that I can pay for gas and pay for tolls because it is expensive. Any and all financial support is to put back into the brand that is Marie Shadows the brand that is the Square Circle Podcast and the brand that is the Square Circle Society to make sure that I give you the best quality and original wrestling content you've never heard in the market before. So if you do not want to sponsor me, even though that's a really big thing for you to do and you get all that shout out, there are other ways that you can sponsor me, which is signing up to Fight TV Plus the subscription base via my link, which will be in the description below. You guys can also download the app upside. If you like to take road trips, if you like to do deliveries and you're using your car 24 seven, I know those gas prices add up. And with my referral link for upside, you can save 25 cents a gallon of gas. Every time that you go out to the gas station and you get to have cash back. Who doesn't want to save a little bit? If that's not something you're into or you're not using your car 24-7, you can always get a subscription to Canva. All of the podcast cover episodes that you see, all of the graphics that I create, especially the graphic I created for my interview with Clark Connors, all of that was used on Canva. Canva is the most easiest way to design graphics where you have no experience. It's okay. Everyone starts with no experience and it's just drag and drop. It's the most easiest thing to use. And with my link down below, you can try a 30 day free trial money back guarantee, but I bet you that you won't want to get that money back. It is a great investment for anybody out there. If you are a podcaster, if you're a writer, if you're a digital artist, you can use Canva for anything that you desire. So the link would be down below. And last but not least, I do have Amazon. I am an Amazon author. I have a wrestling planner. It is the middle of the year, but you could always get this wrestling planner no matter what, any time of the day. And please get it soon because when June 20th comes around, I do have to up the price because Amazon is charging more for their product services. So head over to amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Marie Shadows. The wrestling planner is there. It comes with a complete set of a 12 month calendar, two note sections, a section for seven star ratings. You could definitely be better than Uncle Dave and actually watch matches and color in the stars for how many ratings you think a particular match that you love deserves. And at the end of it, we have the year end awards where you get to create your own award system or reward system. And you get to put in the top 10 wrestlers, tag team wrestlers, referees, anything you want to show them love and appreciation with these awards. So again, Amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Marie Shadows. Fans of mine have already bought their own copy, so don't you delay. Buy your own copy today. All right, let me quickly go over New Japan Pro Wrestling's Dominion. Dominion was held in Osaka Joe Hall. This is every single year. Dominion is one of their biggest pay-per-views. And basically, Dominion is go big or go home. And every single match on this card delivered. I really had... Just a problem with just one match just because it had John Moxley and the Blackpool Combat Club in it. Look, man, John needs to learn how to sell. And if you're in the ring with Ishii, you got to sell to Ishii, man. 
you can't no sell Ishii half the time, even though most of the wrestlers no sell Ishii, but they get to a point where it makes sense that the adrenaline is pumping, but that one good shot that Ishii gives you, you are down and you are selling it. However, I know I'm jumping ahead and I'm supposed to start from the beginning, but my main problem with John Moxley that everyone overhypes this guy and he hasn't really been good at all. Nothing has been good in his AEW career. And that's just his mindset of the way he thinks about wrestling. That wrestling could be anything. Wrestling can, anything can happen. Like, no, dude. That's why there's a foundation of wrestling when it first started and it became professional wrestling. Professional wrestling is the purest form of theater because you get everything in it, but it still has to have a core foundation of what makes it professional wrestling what makes it wrestling and what makes it sports entertainment you can't just be like yeah let's just throw the rule book out the window because if that was the case everything that we consider entertainment and sports would have the same thing well you know ufc is real so like that doesn't count but you get the idea right that like if we threw the book of rules even imaginary rules that like if we throw it out the window then the things that we love to escape in will just die and crumble. So my main issue with that six-man match that is on Dominion is just the fact that Ishii comes in, hits Moxley in the back of the head with his forearm or, like, elbow, and Moxley doesn't fucking sell it. Like, sir, it's Ishii. You can't see behind you. So you have to, like, really sell it. Now, if he was coming directly in front of you and you're able to see it, then, okay, fine. I won't make a big deal about it. But if he's hitting you from the back of the head and you don't know, you don't hear him because you have your opponent in a submission and you're not selling to Ishii, man, you took me out of the fucking match. Like, come on. Come on, dude. Anyway, let's start from the beginning. I, I really can't, like, comment on John Moxie matches. I can't. There's a lot of things that I'm like, bro, you just got to get better at stuff and you got to stop bleeding. At least this time in this six-man match, he bled legitimately with a headbutt. It makes sense. Rather than fucking bleeding. Like, bro, stop fucking bleeding. You don't need to bleed every time and it's not going to mean anything when you're supposed to bleed in a very big, meaningful story. Anyway, let's go to let's go to the first match. We have the United States Championship number one contender tournament match that has been going on, and this is for to set up at Forbidden Door who's gonna face Kenny Omega for that US championship title. I need New Japan Pro Wrestling to stop putting their titles on American wrestlers that are not going to fucking defend it when they're over here in America. That includes Kenny Omega. Like, Kenny at this point should take a vacation because I don't know what else he has left to prove. I really don't know. He should be putting that title on the line on Dynamite to prove that he is one of the best United States championship holders of that belt. But New Japan needs to stop doing this because people forget about championships that new japan pro wrestling has and they don't really do anything with it you want to elevate a division you give it to somebody who can make that division into their own likeness into their own ideas into their own vision that is what you know zack zaber jr is doing with the 15 minute time limits for the new japan tv title that's what david finley is doing with his never open weight championship title Tama never got it off the ground, which is very unfortunate, and he should have had it get it off the ground, but I understand why they gave it to Finley. I understand that, but it's still a very poor decision in the early goings of it. But you don't put it on somebody who's going to be in the United States, and you don't communicate like, hey, you need to defend the title. You can go to other promotions. Just go and defend the title. Anyway. We have Lance Archer versus Osprey. This was a very hard-hitting match with Lance Archer getting most of the advantage in this match. But then Osprey comes back with his comeback and everything that Osprey does in Osprey matches. Osprey did win the match. However, I am concerned of Will Osprey's shoulder. 
I'm just concerned. I don't want this guy to go into early retirement or have to really take an extended long break just to heal up his shoulder because you never know when his shoulder is going to give out because of what he said during his interview with Chris Van Vliet on what the doctors told him about his shoulder. So I'm just concerned about his shoulder. Anyway, at Forbidden Door, we'll see Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay part two. Ospreay should have never lost the fucking title in the first place. We got an eight-man tag of just five guys versus LIJ. It's an eight-man tag. LIJ wins this match. Now we get to the most exciting match of the night. TJP and Akira Francesco. Catch-22 versus Kevin Knight and Kushida for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship titles. And this felt like a really, really good match. Kevin Knight is amazing. Kushida has been amazing during Best of the Super Juniors. Catch-22 is always amazing. They pulled out all the stops in this match, and they were victorious. I believe that makes them two-time IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions. And so they were celebrating in the ring. Dan Maloney was celebrating with them. And then the crafty 100-proof Clark Connors comes out, walks down that aisle, and everyone is, like, not really up in arms. The only person that was up in arms was Dan because... Dan is Dan, or the driller is the driller because this dude wears his heart on his sleeve. This dude would make sure that you have a voice, and if you don't have a voice, he's yelling at somebody or, like, kicking the shit out of somebody, and that's somebody that you need at your side just in case if you can't articulate what you want to do. So, to me, that's a friend that I would love to fucking have. So, TJP was really like, yo, calm down, we'll figure this out type of thing, but... You know, the very cleverness of Clark being to point down the aisle as if someone was going to run down. But no, you know, they pulled the WWE of like when the shield got broken up, you know, Cash 22 wasn't ready. Um, And Dan Maloney decided to betray them, attack them, join Bullet Club. And now he fits rightfully so in Bullet Club, even though he captivated us all with his charm, colorful language and his wrestling ability but he's way more better as a war dog than a united empire guy then we have jeff cobb versus zach zaber jr you guys already know how i feel about this zach zaber jr is still our new japan pro wrestling world tv champion then we had goto and yoshihashi versus evil and yudro versus aaron hanari and the great okan this is for the double tag team championship titles of the New Japan Heavyweight title, and the New Japan Strong titles. If you guys don't know, Aussie Open had to relinquish the titles because Mark Davis ended up somehow injuring his knee, had to get surgery for it, and then we got the news that Aussie Open signed with AEW. So Aussie Open is no longer those tag team champions. This match was fantastic. There was a lot of shenanigans. It felt right. It didn't feel like it was over the top. It could have felt like it was over the top, but it was really good amount of shenanigans. The crowd was into it, and I love looking at the crowd and seeing what happens. However, the match definitely continues, even though Aaron Hanari and the Great Okan really did some powerful-ass moves to Goto and Yoshihashi. If it was up to me, Aaron Hanari and the Great Okan should have been champion, but Evil and Usual stopped all that shit. And even as the match continues, Yoshihashi and Goto manage to get the victory. And then as they are celebrating, we are met with another Bullet Club surprise. Two more new members, which is Gabriel Kidd and Alex Coughlin, decide to come down, beat the shit out of Goto and Yoshihashi, and hold up those double tag team championships. And basically sort of challenging the two for those championship titles on the next episode i will be discussing the g1 climax 33 because i am not happy with the brackets but i would have to respect it then we had the never open weight championship title of david finley defending his championship title against elp elp has become a good guy but i i really don't care David Finley ends up putting El Phantasma through a table and then picking up the victory 
And the Bullet Club War Dogs are celebrating with David Finley inside the ring. David Finley is still our never openweight champion. After that, we get Masawato versus Hiromu for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship title. Masawato has improved leaps and bounds, even though there are a couple of times where he takes two steps back and maybe three steps forward. And Masawato has definitely come a long way. This was a very good match between the two. Hiromu has endurance. That is what I've been saying forever. Hiromu just has this endurance about him that nobody can match. Some people might end up getting the victory because of that endurance. Takes a lot of effort to maintain. But Master Wado needs more time to develop and understand how to really use Hiromu's endurance against him. Hiromu retains the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship title. After that, like I was saying, we had that six-man match that included Okada, Ishii, Tanahashi versus Moxley, Claudio Castagnoli, and Shota Umino. Man, I need Shota to become his own man rather than riding the coattails of John Moxley. There is nothing that you should be emulating from John Moxley, nothing at all. I just wish that Shota, with all of his talent, can become something of his own rather than trying to be the next John Moxley. Sure, the fans love it. The fans love a baby face. People love Tanahashi, and even if Tanahashi tells you who inspired him, Tanahashi still became a household name, and we know him as Tanahashi, and that's who Tanahashi is. When we talk about Shota Umino, it's going to be like, oh, the John Moxley kid that does John Moxley things. Like, sir, get your own fucking identity. You have all the talent in the world. You are actually good as a wrestler. Get your own identity. By the way, going after Okada does not mean you get your own identity. Okada is going to fuck up these kids that step up to him and disrespect them. And I'm here for it because you don't step up to Okada that way. You really don't. And for everyone out there in the internet world that's like, oh, who's Okada? Who's this? Who's that? Okada's a badass motherfucker, and you guys wish you were that badass motherfucker that can definitely run circles around everybody. Okada is Okada, man. He's the rainmaker. He's the one that helped put New Japan Pro Wrestling on the map with everyone else. So give Okada the respect that he deserves. And I understand that whenever we talk about Okada, it's always Okada versus Kenny. Like, there are three series of matches. Like, that's the only thing that we talk about, which is kind of sad. You know, it really is sad. But there's more to Okada than Okada versus Kenny Omega. Okada versus Kenny Omega made both of them and also made New Japan. And that's what people are stuck on. People don't want to go back into the archives of New Japan World and look at older Okada matches and other Okada matches where he has an amazing story that goes on, an amazing match that is with other wrestlers that are not Kenny Omega. And it's kind of sad that we always regurgitate, oh, you should watch Okada versus Kenny Omega, Okada versus Kenny Omega. Tell me something else. Tell fans something else so that way they don't have to come out and be a troll and be a jackass and be like, oh, no one knows Okada. No one knows that. You know, that's old. Why are we bringing up old stuff? Well, if you don't want to bring up old stuff, then do the fucking research and tell us some new Okada matches. But yeah, all these young kids are going to learn that Okada ain't no one to fuck with. Also, in my Discord, if you're not already signed up to my Discord, I really did say because I reviewed New Japan Pro Wrestling's Dominion in my Discord with everybody, I really did say that John Moxley is overexposed. Like, he needs to take a really good break so that way he doesn't have to be overexposed anymore. Now we get to the main event of New Japan Pro Wrestling's Dominion, which is Yoda Suji versus Sonata for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship title. This was a fantastic main event. Apparently, it went only 17 minutes, and it did everything that it needed to do to elevate Suji and tell the world that the New Japan Pro Wrestling excursion program fucking works. Suji is amazing. He's been like my favorite 
Young Lion graduate ever since I saw him first step into New Japan Pro Wrestling. And I was amazed at what he can do. You guys could go back into my catalog where I talked about the Young Lions then, which included Gabriel Kidd at the time. And I was like, man, Gabriel Kidd and, and Suji and, and Yuya, they're all going to be very fantastic wrestlers. They're going to be fantastic for New Japan Pro Wrestling. And I was fucking right. Even though Yuya is not signed with New Japan at the moment. But regardless, Yuya, Suji... Gabe, and I forgot who else was in that group, but all of them are going to be fucking stars. Suji is a star every time he walks out with LIJ. I'm surprised he aligned himself with LIJ, even though that's what he wanted to do because he always wanted to study Mexican wrestling. So he managed to go down to Mexico to do that too, as well as be in the UK and get that British style. Suji is going to be a force to be reckoned with. And in this match, Sonata found out pretty quickly. Now, in the internet, people were saying that Sonata didn't get the pop that he should have got from the fans. Well, did you watch the fucking match? Suji was wowing the crowd. Suji was doing things to Sonata that took Sonata off of his game plan. Sonata has a very rigid game plan when it comes to his wrestling. If you're not following his outline, his path, what he dictates during the match, then he does not know how to recover until halfway through and he has to think on his feet that is what suji was doing suji was taking sonata off of the game plan that sonata usually runs by and that's why most sonata matches to me are kind of boring because it's the same thing he doesn't take any risk now on the other hand suji is over here taking lots and lots of risk and what is sonata doing to slow down the match applying cold skull to suji this allows Sonata to think, to compose himself, because Sonata's not really good as a wrestler who thinks on his feet. Suji is like, I'm going to go 100 miles per hour. It doesn't matter. It's going to land. I'm going to risk it all. And most of the time, like, Suji capitalizes on that in this match. Sonata does eventually get the upper hand on Suji, but Suji looks strong. Sonata looks like he's a little off his game, like I've been saying. But in the end, Sonata does retain the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship title in a very tough fight of a victory. The fans really wanted a new champion at this point because they were cheering for Suji. They were like, oh my God, maybe there's a chance that we could get a new champion. And that's not a slight to Sonata as Sonata being a bad champion. He just got the championship title, but... If somebody can rock Sonata like that, man, I'll cheer for the underdog too. I'll cheer for the young lion that graduated, went over to the UK, went over to Mexico, coming back and proving why he is the best. This is the same concept that they did with Jay White when Jay White came back from excursion and he became Switchblade Jay White. Who's the first person he went after? The big guy, Okada, when he was champion. The first person he goes after is Okada to show the world that the excursion that he went on proved to be the best thing he ever did. That is what they're doing with Suji. Suji comes back from excursion, goes after the big champion, almost had him, but it still proved that the New Japan Pro Wrestling excursion program is still one of the best things to do for these guys. All right, that was the quick review of new japan pro wrestling dominion on the next episode of the square circle podcast i am going over the g1 climax 33 the blocks and what we know so far and i'm going to be talking about the june 10th six man that had bullet club versus the united empire i'll go into more detail about that but i really want to say thank you guys for listening to this podcast episode i already put over all my stuff on how you can sponsor me you could do it through a sponsor package. You could do it through one of the affiliate links, such as Fight TV, Upside, Canva, Amazon, and just in general, 
There's a lot more ways to support me. All you have to do is just follow me on social media at Marie underscore shadows. You can slide into my DMs for more information about sponsoring a podcast episode, buying some ad space, something, anything that you want at Marie underscore shadows for that. Make sure to sign up to my wrestling newsletter, which is an extension of everything that I do. Marie shadows.substack.com. And also, Get into the Discord. We talk about wrestling 24-7. We comment on the weekly wrestling that you see. So from WWE, AEW, Impact Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, it's there for you guys. It's there to build a wrestling community that is non-toxic and non-backstabby. And we all lift each other up and we're all friends. And we make sure that we have a damn good time talking about professional wrestling. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to an episode of the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows, and I'll see you guys on the next one.